Welcome to it, folks. It's a privilege to have your company back again with another fresh episode of APX, where we help educate you in becoming the various facets in which makes you an unbreakable mind, an unstoppable force, leading to becoming an untamed spirit and also forming your own army of one. This is a very sensitive subject that I'm going to talk about. So the best thing to do is I'm going to subject unto you, either the viewer or the listener, a premise. And it's a pure and simple sentence that comes from a book which is now recently seen reprint by George Clayson called The Richest Man in Babylon. The line reads, make your home a profitable dwelling. Now that can refer to either that fancy mansion that you live in on the hill, or that could refer, of course, to the uh, god-awful little flat that you live in. Let's take it a step further. What about the meat shield that you possess? Now, either way, you look like the Tower of France, or uh, for that fact, maybe the Schwedigan Pagoda <laughs> residing in Burma. The fact is, your body is an instantaneous result of what you program here, leading me to another facet about stress. Stress, we all go through it. Many years ago, a former colleague of mine, actually was my uh, employer, said to me, there's good stress and bad stress. Sorry to say it's a load of claptrap. Stress is stress. How you manage it is ultimately the onus, which separates the corn from the chaff, separates the boys from the men. But let me not be too cavalier. Compulsive eating is a pandemic in own right. Does it mean that you have to... Ping pong, or as I heard the term yo yo diet, or do you have to just reevaluate your relationship with the intake? Remember, your body needs fuel, so you can't fast continually. But before I go completely off kilter with all the terminology, I've brought an expert in this field, and I feel that this episode may be applicable to both men and women who have a very, shall I say, askew version with eating. Helen Bennett is a specialist in this area who helps to define our relationship with food as, as, as a whole. She helps to you build a vision regarding your relationship and what it can be with food. But let me not hog all the glory. And let me just add this as well. For a lady currently residing in Spain, I'm proud to announce that Helen Bennett reigns from my native shore. Helen, welcome yes. to APX, darling. Absolutely wonderful to be here, Chris. Thank you so much for that. Um, that introduction was great. There's some juicy stuff in there, and I love the quote that you started with. I look forward to diving into that. Please go look up the book, Richest Man in Babylon. It has been in circulation for many a year. Mm. But Helen, tell me a bit about yourself. You come from my country. Which part? Let's kick off there. Oh, great question. I grew up in Johannesburg. And oh, my neck of the woods. Oh, <laughs> yes, I did. And then when I was, I went to university at Rhodes and then I moved to Cape Town after that. And then I spent my best years in my favorite town in the whole world, which is nice. I was now. born in Cape Town. Oh, there we go. I'm from Durban. Why were you so surprised when I said Johannesburg? Did I seem like uh, a bit of a small town girl now? No, 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 no. None whatsoever. <laughs> Majority, you know this as well as I. South Africans, we mix with our own. So if you're from Cape Town, you mix with Cape Townians. If you're from a Joe, if you're from Joburg, you're you're a Joburger. And if you're from King Shaka, then of course you're going to be a Shakian. If that's a word. <laughs> it is now. Should be. <laughs> you told me you swatted journalism at Rhodes. What made yeah, you sure. switch completely from journalism to personal health? Oh, great question. Um, okay, there's a bit of a backstory to this. Please Before feel free. I went to Rhodes, I went to the University of Stellenbosch. And right, right. I studied engineering. I started off doing engineering, and then I switched very quickly to a BSc with psychology. Okay. And the only reason I was studying engineering, and I think you'll enjoy this, is not because I'd always wanted to be an engineer, but because as a child, I, I was good at physics and I was good at biology and all of that. Science and I went to one of those career... Yeah. Stuff I sucked at, I might say. <laughs> oh, really? I sucked, I big sucked time. at English and all of the things that I now spend Rubbish. so much time doing. Rubbish. It was one of my worst subjects. Um, so, you know, you live and learn, but there was a little girl who was good at physics and good at science, but loved 
people. And oh, so right. I loved the movies and I just wanted to be in the movies. But at that time, it was such a pie in the sky idea. This is like back in it 19- still is. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. You're but talking I think to a these former, days former you soap opera like actor. This- oh, <laughs> See, now we're getting to know each other. <laughs> but long story short, I, I thought, well, the way to get into the movies is to be an engineer because then I could maybe build. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. I was so young. I thought that's going to be my route in. Like if I could be involved in the machinery or something, you know, like just ridiculous. Because I went to a great school, but at the time it was all doctor, lawyer, engineer. You know, we were just being pushed down certain tracks. Mm. And... So I went to Stellenbosch, started engineering, very quickly realized this was not my gig, um, and switched to BSc with psychology. So there was the key. There was a part of me that wanted to move in that direction. Um, And then I went to Rhodes to study journalism. I don't really know why. I'm going to just say I was called. And in journalism, I guess, again, it's that connection with people and story. And and I I always had this deep sensitivity and understanding of people and I felt right. all the emotion I think that's why I loved movies but mm. I had this physics brain so it didn't it didn't seem to match but versatility in I've the done... beginning is always a confusing thing isn't it <laughs> yeah yeah particularly when you're not at that point so good at thinking for yourself and following that inner instinct right and I was very much people oh, please let's just do what everybody says you know just I follow if somebody gives me advice I'm taking it and um since Probably that was the turning point. I love that you started there because I hadn't really clocked that. But actually, when I made the decision to go to Rhodes and to study journalism psychology, I was beginning to own that inner whisper that's led me to where I am now. And everything I've done since then, from running a guest house in Meisner to being a CrossFit owner, CrossFit gym owner, to working as a chef, all of it's been about connecting with people and finding ways to help people feel good. And now and let me it's take weird. it a step further. It brung you yep. full circle into yeah. where you have come today. Exactly. I've always, I've always said to a lot of people in your circumstances and then in others, we need to eliminate the word fail from our vocabulary. Oh, I agree. There's, there's too much of an emphasis of when you, if I may use French, if you fuck up, you fuck up pertinently. And that's a big, big plague here in South Africa still. And it's Mm. within the social hierarchy of families, sorry to say. I went Mm. through it. Um, You especially coming from the previous generation must have gone through it as well. But take the word fail, case in point, and break it down into an acronym. First, action in learning. Meaning, try out everything you can. Anything that might pique your interest, as long as you just give yourself some breath to start off with then ultimately using your example where you went from first engineering then to fitness then journalism and then coming to the place where you want to be you've just Mm. eliminated what doesn't work for you so the failure element is gone with the wind make sense absolutely and we're going to dive big into failure because the topic of today there's a lot of failure involved and that that mindset that you have is exactly the one that's necessary. And we can go deep into that in order to break free of disordered eating. Because if we're Mm. not willing to fail or we think every fail's a fuck up and I don't mind the French, (laughs) then we're buggered because we'll never make it. We have to be willing to fail and learn. And the second thing on that is at the time it felt like, oh, Helen, you don't know what you're doing. You're just bouncing around. But now in retrospect, journalism couldn't have been more perfect because now I'm in sure. an environment where we've got to be on social media. We're doing things like this. Exactly. All of those skills have suddenly become the best asset I could have had. Nothing was wasted. Not my guest house ownership, not my chefing, nothing. It's all coming together in this almost to perfection. But in a way I could never have imagined at all. Would well, let me, take, let me meet you halfway. I thought I was going to be a just disc jockey for the rest of my career. I was infatuated with, I'll use a name from your generation, I mm-hmm. fell in love with, uh, shame he's just passed uh, last year, uh, John Burks. I loved. Oh, goodness me. Oh, wow. I loved yeah. John Burks. You and I come from Cape Town. Do you remember Alan Barnard? No. From KFM. You're going to have to refresh my memory. I didn't really listen to KFM. I was also, a 5FM girl. <laughs> or for that fact, 
loved, I loved, yeah. I still love him to this day, Barney Simon. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, late night Barney Simon when I was oh, young. Oh, yes, Woo! the powerhouse. That was and my jam. you won't believe it, uh, <laughs> Keith Lindsay has just returned to radio. Oh, my gosh, that's insane. The Shadow Show with the terrible the twins. Show. Yes, of course. God, how brilliant. No, well, I mean, wonderful. And, and I thought I was going to be a disc jockey for the rest of my life. Yeah. And when 2020 struck, Influx came from overseas, and I just went with it. You have to mm. go with the flow. Yeah. And who would have thunk? Who would have mm. thunk that you and I would be talking three years down the line? So the case in point is here, folks. Important highlight. There's no such thing as failure. Mm. Case in point. But you have to take a couple of dips, or better yet, let me use Tony Stark from Iron Man. You have mm -hmm. to run before you can crawl. Oh, I so like I'll, that. Yeah. I'll meet you halfway. Let's talk about disordered eating. Yeah. Uh, body positivity, I don't know where the word comes from, or the phrasing comes from, is now sacrosanct in yeah. the social circle. It doesn't matter if you're thin as a rake or if you're as wide as a bus. You have no right to judge. Where is the mishap with regards to disordered eating? Let's just get out of that out of the way first. Okay, help me understand the question. So I got the posi the body positivity thing, and it sounds like we've both got some perspectives on that, which are probably in alignment. Mm. How, what, is, what is the question about the mishap? Where do people get things wrong with disordered eating? Oh, is it just okay. overeating or is it undereating? What is the probably. actual disease or disorder? Oh, I love that you corrected that as well. So disordered eating, we could, I think, say, I mean, I think it's all actually personal. Do we feel something's wrong? Do we feel out of sync with our body? If the answer is yes, there's something going on. You know, if I think about it as simple as we're not, uh, we're not constantly worrying about how we breathe. Mm. But if we did and we started thinking, oh, I'm supposed to be taking three seconds in, three seconds out, and if I get anything wrong, then I've made a mistake, then we might start creating some kind of disordered breathing <laughs> scenario. Whereas right. when we breathe, right. we're not worrying about it. And similarly, my concept of freedom, so I, I talk about food freedom because it's the best terminology I have, but it's really that ability to feel that relaxation, that that you're not thinking about it. You just eat <laughs> and it's no big deal. And now that might you. be a far-fetched principle for a lot of people, but in many ways we were born that way. Of course you know? we were. We just return to that. So the question, where does it all go wrong? That's a big one. I, it's different for everyone. And I don't call it a disease. It never sat well with, well with me. So for those who don't know, I struggled with bulimia for 20 years and chronic. I mean, I was three times a day where I'd binged and purged was a good day. Seven times was. Good grief. I know. It's hard to imagine. And it must be shocking for anybody who's never been surrounded by that heard about that it must be revolting disgusting horrifying um and and it's even still hard to talk about it although i'm becoming much more comfortable with speaking about this to people who haven't struggled um but what i came to realize when i heard words like disorder or disease they didn't feel right again it, would, it was that intuitive this isn't sitting i don't feel like i have a disease this isn't cancer because on some level I'm doing, I have control, but then I don't. And it, it was definitely disorder, but that didn't feel like enough. When I started looking at, I started hearing about addiction more and more, and it just started to fit the model. And to this day, every definition, I've heard so many definitions, different definitions of addiction. Every time I hear them, I think, yep, that's what it is. So the question is, well, what drives addiction? And I guess my simplistic answer for that would be, pain every time it's oh. just a person's way of adapting to pain and everybody's addictions are different because they're probably the best fit that handle the pain the best mm. um and as human beings we find ways to cope with pain and it's usually the pain of and this is just you know spoiler alert we're getting straight to the bottom of it the pain of not enough rejection of course. not being loved simple as that and we just reach for different tools. So we can go into the story to make more sense of how I ended up in bulimia. But of course, the problem started a lot earlier. <laughs> you know. Okay. Can I ask so directly, you the story? did you have 
a very balanced or unbalanced family life? You can absolutely ask directly. In being in the family, I didn't know. It felt balanced because I didn't know anything else. And I felt, I certainly was felt deeply loved by my mum and am, still am. My dad, different story. My uh, dad, sadly. I'm with you. Yeah, oh, yeah. I thought there'd be a bit of, and I think a lot of people listening, sadly, will have some kind of, whether it's their father, their mother, or somebody very close to them. Usually when we root this stuff back in time, there's a, I guess we could call it if we had to put a label, narcissistic personality deep in the past that caused a lot of pain and damage. Hello. Did I just nail it? <laughs> yeah. Now, to be fair to my father, he was a damaged boy. And his mm. way of dealing with his, I mean, he left home at 17. I don't even want to know why. Um he used to tell us he was born in a factory because he didn't want to talk about his childhood. I mean, that's the level of pain he must have been in. Sure. Now, that doesn't mean that it's okay that he became a mean, viciously cruel, narcissistic man who could turn on charm in an instant and withdraw it at a moment's notice and leverage love, you know, it, dial it up when he wanted to get something and dial it away and take it, withdraw it. Now, as a child, we have to be loved have to have connection we will die without it so my adaption was i will do anything and i will be anything to get his love which was impossible because he would keep drawing it back and giving it and drawing it back and i don't want to speak to my sister's journey but she had a different way of coping with that but we both developed ways of dealing mm -hmm. and mine led me into a place where i started to doubt my lovability and then when boys, because I only had a sister, no brothers, and no male cousins, so I was at an all-girls school. Right. So when boys came into the picture and I wasn't, didn't have a boyfriend, I my young brain, so young, started to think, oh, you see, there's evidence that I'm not lovable. My dad doesn't, and these boys don't, so therefore, I, you know, what am I going to do? And... So weight loss became the mechanism that I thought I could get love. love. And right, I started right. to lose weight when I still went on diets when I was about 14. Good By grief. 16, I'd overheard somebody talking about throwing up their food. I'd never, it was horrifying to me when I first, I would, had never even thought of it. But of course, once I'd heard it, the idea sat, and it wasn't long before I was trying that too. Now, shame, poor girl, 16 years old, all she wants to do is have a boyfriend so she can feel some love and care in her life. But what I didn't realize in the time is how compulsive that behavior would become and how it would start fixing all sorts of other issues. So it started off, I just want to lose a bit of weight. I lost weight. Now I want to keep it off. And it became, oh, well, actually this losing control with food and then getting rid of it. Wow, that, that helps me with my anger, my frustration, my inability to express my feelings in this kind of dominant with this dominant father who could lash it out at any moment it it was just this pill for all ill this this one set of behaviors that could help alleviate any emotion much like drugs alcohol phone sex addiction whatever everybody's trying to Which escape the feeling from. right oh yeah I've, I've heard you share that in one of your episodes mm. alcohol addiction. and thank you for being so open there's a lot oh, of people who are going to benefit from it. You know, if there's one thing I can really relate to your story, I know what it's like to live mm -hmm. in a destructive family unit. Mm -hmm. But I want to praise you, and I'm not blowing your skirt for the purposes of recording this episode. It takes a real, real strong woman to forgive a parent for being neglectful and understanding why they were neglectful. That is the mm -hmm. modicum of both empathy and forgiveness. And I only learned that quite recently. So you, I tip my hat to you, madame. <laughs> Chris, first, I'm really glad to hear you've learned that too. And to be honest, it took me a long time to get there. I held rage for years. And it was really only in 2019. <laughs> Cheesy as it sounds, I went to a Tony Robbins event. <laughs> I'm Miami. a Tony Robbins fan, don't I? Oh, I love Tony Robbins. 
And we did this whole like unleashing and screaming and nothing was happening. But I, I went there. With yeah, this, the warrior this, scream. I, I went ballistic when he did a YouTube video on that. Yeah, <laughs> it's wonderful. Absolutely bananas. Many people thought I should left. actually belong in an insane asylum. Yeah, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> but you see, we were unleashing all the emotion, the anger, the rage in a permissive environment where it was okay and safe to do so. Absolutely. And I went there knowing I'd forgiven my dad logically. I'd done all the therapy, I'd, I'd lo but I wasn't there. I couldn't feel it yet. Sure. Emotionally, it psycho dark, psychologically. Yeah. yeah. Blackness that was still inside and I knew it was there. And I went there thinking if there's one thing I'd like to come away from this event, because I'd already heard all Tony's stuff and kind of knew it off by heart. But I thought, I just want to release that. Mm. And we did the big scream and I was still sitting in it. But then about an hour later, I could just feel it's gone. I'm done. It's, I'm were finished. you also bawling your eyes out afterwards, even after you were screaming like a banshee? No, I think I just felt relief. I just literally, I just fell to my knees and I began crying. And I mean, wow, Chris. A, a guy who's literally over 30 years old, crying like a baby, where you can't even, because you know, men's voices dip after a certain age, after their 20s. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a guy like me crying like a <laughs> little a little boy after that. But yeah, it was, if I were to feel anything that resembled empowerment, it would be something like that. But tell me, after going through this, you have been very, very, I appreciate your candor in speaking about mm -hmm. your horrible upbringing in a very, very condensed manner. I appreciate that. Mm, yeah. uh, I appreciate the fact that you spoke about um, trying to find love, which led you to bulimia. Take me to mm. the point where you decided to full-on commit to the study of disordered eating and its origins? Mm. Oh God, another great question, because my answer is going to be unusual. No, um, there's no such thing as unusual answers. <laughs> there's well, answers might, and then I, there's stories. <laughs> so I have not committed to the study of disordered eating, and I'm so grateful I didn't. I committed to the study of addiction recovery. Ah. Okay. But it's the study of nutrition, for sure. I thought the answers would be all there. Oh, if we could just get the perfect diet, then all would be well. Oh, no, it just wasn't in the food, apparently. I committed to the study of psychedelics because, again, oh, could there be another tool, another thing? I'm Correct. Sure. And the answer was the same. It's Those are all just interesting pieces of information, but it was like you already know what the problem is. It's uh, people not enough. They're not feeling lovable. You've seen it again and again. And um, look, I'd love to go back in time. Would I? No. I was just about to say I'd love to go back in time and get a degree so I could have the word doctor in front of my name so that people would think they Don't could. Don't waste take your time. Don't agree. waste your time. I'll give you, I'll give you a resource. If you really want to uh, get something behind your name, you can do it within a fraction of a second. I'll give you a resource. And you can just get <laughs> that certificate. <laughs> but to be honest... I started in 2015, 2016, I was really interested. First of all, I was in my journey of recovery. I went to 12 steps. I was getting some interesting stuff out of that, practical tools, but I still felt, what's the what's the skill? What's the step zero? I still don't know how to stop. And then I did the most phenomenal uh, eight-week course with a chap called Tommy Rosen. Do you know him? Recovery 2.0? Okay. But I'll Doesn't look matter. up the name. I'll look up the yeah, name. Yeah, I think you'll love his stuff. Um, and it was all online before Zoom, so it was sort of YouTube and um, uh, Facebook, and I was up at one o'clock in the morning because he's in LA, and it was an amazing group, and that game just brought me a little bit closer, but when I did that with Tommy, I knew then I wanted to do what I do now. Ah, That's so you were called to it. Oh, uh, I, I, You know what, to be honest, I think I was called in one of the first 12-step meetings I went to, but everyone said, oh, everybody does that. So I sort of thought, oh, well, I'm just being silly. <laughs> but hang on here. Yeah. You went to 12-step meetings and you also committed to addiction recovery. Were you using substances as well? No, no. I was desperate, Chris. I had done a lot okay. of therapy. I'm with you. I'm really with good, you. But I didn't have – I couldn't find resources that resonated and helped. Oh, okay. And so I was okay. like, well, this so one, maybe this will blank. work. Yeah. And I actually, okay. there were no eating disorder. Uh, 
what is Overeaters Anonymous uh, in Neisner. So all we had. There was still a, isn't. Oh, really? Oh, my gosh. That's the gap. What do you think? Mo- I started hel- having yeah. a cuppa before APX. I was trying to get it here done in Southern, Southern Africa to get a oh sober community gosh. going. And that's why I got all those Americans and Canadians in because they yeah. were doing their rounds on social media to just help the South Africans who were strugg- struggling with addiction in any given form or function. And what did I get for it? I got my fucking head rolled for it. You let it out. You let it out. <laughs> no, that's terrible. Well, thank goodness for thank goodness for this online world. So for all the bad things True. that this disconnection brings, it brought me to Tommy Rosen, which took me another step forward. And I think I have the great joy now of connecting with people who are not – we're not bound by having to be face to face because when I was mm. trying to recover, recover, it was very much you had to find somebody face to face in your town. Otherwise, how are you going to do it? And that allows me to help people wherever they are with the tools that I stumbled across, developed, and also learned. So I never really, but so to cut to answer your question, I started helping people struggling with bulimia again, a little against my will. I think it was a bit of the teacher was ready. So then the students started appearing. So I knew I wanted to do this, but I thought, well, I'm, it's too early days. You know, I'm still, I've only just got a few years of good eating under my belt. I've still got lots to learn. Let me do life coaching. Let me do health coaching. And I took on a few clients and they all had bulimia. So I was like, oh, well, I could help you because actually I did too. And these are my tools. And then they started getting better. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to dive in. I'm just going to dive in. It's unbelievable the gift of teaching, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and maybe actually that points a little bit more to this conversation, the hidden nature of this disorder, because the clients that I took on as life coaching clients, it took a while before we stumbled into a conversation where they said, you know what, I've been struggling with food. And I would say, oh, don't worry, I had bulimia, you've got nothing to worry about. And then oh, turns out they did too. And what scares me is how hidden so much of this must be. I think the statistics must be horribly wrong, not just on bulimia, binge eating, feeling out of control, anorexia. feeling compulsive. Anorexia is probably easier to visibly see, so one might guess. Of course. Um, and, of course, it's so dangerous that um, people w- will, you know, die if they don't get help. Because they starve the themselves. News, yeah. The bad news about compulsive eating where there's a loss of control is it's so well hidden. You wouldn't Very believe well the people who reach out to me, they do not look like they have a problem. You know, when you see obesity, you can see it. When you see anorexia, you can see it a bit. I'm being very, you know, blanket with this. Oh, obviously, of course, stereotypical. Of but Out of respect for what you do. You can see them. It's all the stuff in between that you can't see. And this is why I'm so grateful to be on podcasts like this, because we get to start saying to all the people who are silently struggling with this feeling of what is wrong with me? Why can't I stop doing this stuff with food? Whether it's just overeating occasionally or feeling horribly out of control what what we're saying is you're not alone (laughs) there's a a lot of this happening out there and we can't see it because people feel such shame i mean with alcohol it's so glorious now to see how many people are embracing the alcohol-free lifestyle it's becoming cool very and that's great we need that to happen but those same people will jump on a call with me and they won't have told anybody about their relationship with food because it's still got so much shame attached to it. And I think for men, even more so, but now maybe you can speak to that. I have men, male clients. It's my suspicion that it's a lot harder for men well, to ask. Well, let me put help. it this way. I think men's minds have been poisoned mm. with regards to what food to eat and what food not to eat because we have so much variety these days. A lot of men mm-hmm. go vegan. A lot of women, uh, men choose gluten-free. But mm-hmm. at the same time, the last two diets that I've mentioned, now more and more studies have come out. Vegan and gluten aren't so healthy as what people think they are because you're depriving your body of protein. You're de- mm-hmm. deriving or, 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 or uh, what did I? What's the word I wanted to use? You are um, depleting your body of amino acids, which come from red meat. Why? Because the vegan diets and the non-gluten products were originally brought in because of excess chemicals in commercial foods. So we try to avoid that. But now, where does your body get protein and amino acids? So that 
causes the brain to go into a flat tailspin. Now, you try this. If that doesn't work, you try this. Some men prefer to overeat through means of carbo loading, then hitting the gym. But then um. scarcely after or half an hour, because I'm also trained as a uh, fitness coach, go into a, 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 a deficit, or they are uh, the opposite of deficit. They're an overload, sorry. Mm -hmm. And they can barely get a half an hour of a good workout in because then that carbohydrates is causing excess um, uh, insulin to enter the bloodstream, which prohibits adrenaline. So there's also amongst men a lot of mm. um, bad relationships with food. Now, you can mm. correlate with me on this if you should so wish because you are – you also have experience in this. What is the perfect combination of food to uh, exercise ratio? For me, everybody's different. Some people mm. can take in a higher amount of protein and a lower amount of carbohydrates or even reverse, dependent on what? Your blood type. Am I wrong? Okay. I would agree, and I'll take that a bit further. Please do. I was so lucky to study nutrition with a lecturer, head lecturer, whose name I've totally forgotten. But his entire premise was we are all so bio-individual. One man's Thank poison you. is another man's medicine. So, Correct. of course, your blood tape type plays a role but so does your stress level so does your sleep so does the weather so does your genetics so does exactly you know, and that's why i love the information like by all means let's get the information let's try it out you know you be feel called to be vegan i went vegan i loved it other people hate it it doesn't work for them my body thrived but when i started doing crossfit again i needed more protein so i ate meat you know because i was then i was starting to go okay i need to listen by that stage i was getting the the download it was important to listen not to stick to some kind of diet that we think should and i use that word very carefully work because when you use the word you said men's words men's minds are poisoned it was an interesting choice of words because there's some there's a there's a kind of truth to it i don't know if i'd use the word poison but i don't know what better word to use I think we're all so right at the minute with so much nutritional information coming at us. And we've got to remember, nutritional science is so new. You know, we have a diet today, the next it's a different one, then there's a new discovery. Let's just take it as interesting. Test something out. If your body loves protein, you will know. If your body loves carbs, you will know. Why do you carbs, think I said it that know. way? Because I was exactly. looking for that answer. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, this is the key, but that's why I really teach intuitive eating, which is not just eat whatever you feel like, it's listen, hear your body. If you've tried out something, you're going keto, give it a go. If your body's screaming at you, this isn't working for me, I'm afraid to tell you, it's best you listen. And that's where mm -hmm. we get back in tune with that. And then the information becomes interesting if it's in alignment. Then we can get a deeper understanding of our body through the information. But what we tend to do is go information first, and then we shame ourselves because we're not sticking to the the information. It's got to be the other way around. <laughs> Try something. Thank you, see. Helen Bennett. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Helen, I want to talk about something personal as well because you are very, very open. I've also loved your posts on Instagram. If you don't mind me asking, you are a decade older than I. Yes. How do you retain looking so young? Uh, this is all lighting, Chris. It's not by accident. No rubbish. <laughs> Not, not a chance. I mean, I would have almost confused you as a couple of years younger than I, but it's also your personality. I think um, you're very, I mean, very young. I love, love the compliment. I'm, and in the past, I would have, I think I just did bat it away because it is a bit lighting. I'm, my little bit of journalism helped <laughs> because there's a, definitely a way to make me look a lot different and a lot older. But here's the thing I think I'm in a way. I'm I'm getting older and my my body's changing. It's aging. It is. I don't look aesthetically as young as I used to, but the more I do the work that I do, the more I unleash the love and the joy that was suppressed for so long. And I think I'm just a lot happier. And maybe what you see as youth is just 
joy, radiance, I don't know, something like ah, that. I mean, I it's, that. I mean, it's, it feels a bit cocky to say so, but I can feel no, it. No, it doesn't. They, you know? No, it doesn't. You're celebrating yourself and you Yay. deserve that. <laughs> you deserve well, that. Because it. <laughs> it wasn't an easy way out of that. Um, My friend, so nothing is ever. Years of <laughs> let me let me uh, meet you halfway. I also struggled struggled with body image issues. Remember, I also had an abusive dad. Uh, my father was a copacetic, excessive drinker. I also struggled with alcoholism between sixteen and twenty six. After I got sober, five months later, here I get a cancer diagnosis. And when I had oh, to, goodness me. Uh, when I had to adopt a vegan diet for my blood platelets when I was undergoing treatment, I ballooned 20 kilograms above my body weight. Wow, so, Chris, that must have been very uncomfortable, mentally and, and physically. Very, very. But then again, I thought the vegan diet was going to help me make me skinnier. Mm. Only it, it made me bloat like a fish. Mm. But... What happens? Through failure, we learn. And through those lessons, we put in the hard work again, and then we start reaping the results. So mm. now I'm down from where I was originally, uh, 110. I'm now 90 kilos. Wow. And, and so was that through really trying to listen and hear your body's... Really trying to listen. Yeah. And, Lovely. Uh, what I realize is I should, for, me, for my body, mm -hmm. for my mental health, it's best that I keep my sugar to a minimum. Copy, so copy. keep the carbohydrates um, and the carbonated sugar at an excess. Take in a high amount of protein. Um, get in a lot more H2O and get in a lot more exercise. I'm a very big fan of hybrid athletics. If the term seems a little bit obscure, it's a combination between um, twice a day, cardio and weightlifting. And it shouldn't mm. be done in the same session. I spoke to a gentleman on this yesterday, just by so, by chance. Um, he runs around our neighborhood, and then he get, hits the gym straight after. And I said, that's fine. You're putting your body in a dehydrated state. So you're also putting your body into a calorie deficit, meaning that your metabolism is going to go into overdrive, but you are also hurting your muscles and you're hurting your nerves. Separate the two. Like, for example, I will wake up happily at 3 o'clock in the morning, go for a run, then afterwards do my daily activities because then my mind is refreshed, the motor neurons in my brain are activated, the muscles are nice and loose, the psoas muscles, which patrol all the major organs in the body, is in full taut, and then also you give your body the recuperating period, then to shock it in the afternoon when you go do your weights or you go do your... Um, biking, or you go do your CrossFit, or your high, your hit, or your high IT. So that is what essentially hybrid uh, hybrid athletics entail. But doing it all excessively, you're going to burn your body out, mm. and then you can tear your muscles, and that's not what you want. No. So I um, love that you've found you've obviously it's, you've played with different things, and you're finding something that Big really time. works for you. And I think that's the Which key. If anybody's me. listening, they might try that. And if it works for them, great, do more of that. If it doesn't, okay, let's try something else. I mean, for years, I try. wanted to be a yogi because I thought, oh, it looks so lovely. It's just not for me, Chris, to be honest. I try. <laughs> but ultimately, I'm more of a crossfitting girl, you know, and I've loved more aggressive kind of running and that. And, and that's and CrossFit for me, is that's wonderful. Movie, right? Yeah. But this I is it. CrossFit is great for prepping things. with – Ultra marathons. I think yeah, it's great yeah. preparation for ultra marathons. It's a good point, actually. Well, you know, the point is there's no right sport and there's no right diet. It's all interesting. Let's find the thing that works for us. You know, and that's hard in a world that's saying, well, this is right and this is wrong and sugar's bad, but wait, next year there'll be a next, you know, car uh, carnivore meets in at the moment. Oh, it'll be out next and there'll be something else. <laughs> Let's just take it all with a pinch of salt and see if we can actually listen. Because I promise you, if you need protein, your body will scream for it. And if you need much. carbohydrates, your body will scream. Just like it screams for water and sleep and all these and sunlight, and fresh air. It's whether we're willing to listen. That's the hard bit. Correct. It's actually listening and then doing what we can hear. Because how often 
have we had that little whisper inside that's going, this isn't a good idea, <laughs> and we do it anyway. And it's a still small voice. It's a literal still <laughs> yeah. small voice. Yeah, you just I think literally you can get good at letting that voice, be quite, that voice be quite loud if you're willing to practice. Joe Rogan would call it an inner bitch. Ooh, that like that. voice. It's that sure. voice, in case you were wondering. Yeah. I was addressing yeah. the, the viewer. Sure. <laughs> I'm sure, not me. I've got it. Yeah. Yeah, it's but listening Helen, to that. Tell me, um, what role would you play when people come to you? And just tell me again, what is it that you teach? What kind of eating? Okay. The so term. I started off just working with bulimics and binge eaters whether they'd been diagnosed uh -huh. or not. I mean, as if they're doing those behaviors, we pretty much could be sure they were in the right camp. And very quickly, other people would come out of the woodwork. The people that I work with now, I just call any, I, I just call it people who feel out of control. So not hyper control. So anorexia might be in the extreme control. It's people who feel loss of control, where they are regularly eating to excess despite a mental desire to not do it or despite deep regret um, the following day. It's that feeling of, I went beyond, and I knew I was doing it, and I did it anyway. And I'm starting to feel out of control. It's the thing I hear the most. So we might call that compulsive. And there's usually a degree of obsession there as well. So I prefer not to put a label on it, but I know that I'm in the camp of out of control, not hyper control. Every now and again, somebody okay. reaches out, and they might be struggling with what we might call anorexia. I'm not allowed to diagnose this, and I wouldn't try. But Literally. what I feel with that is a tightness and an unwillingness to let go, whereas with most people who come to me that I work with, with compulsive eating, they're just saying, please just show me how to stop. I just want to stop ah. desperately. That's I difference. see. So that's um, my niche of disordered eating. It's it's We could call it gray area disordered eating, but right into full-on bulimia. Tell me, I mean, what takes the mindset to recover? Oof, oh, God, great question. I'm so glad we're going there. This, the key to this, and this brings us back to the failure, because we can't just go cold turkey. It's not like uh, being able to give up and drug or even um, – Social media, you can give that up. Sex, you can give it up. You know, there's things you can just stop doing. I'm not saying it's easy, but <laughs> we can't stop. I'm not saying, oh, you can just stop drinking if you're alcohol. Yes, I know this is hard. But the thing with compulsive eating is people engage, have to engage with food continually. And because they've sure. already created the neurochemical loop of when I eat, boom, I lose control. There's an almost inevitable, I'm not even almost, it is inevitable, that at some point, no matter how diligent and hardworking, and usually the people who reach out to me are extremely hardworking, diligent, disciplined. Um, ah, you can be as that's a disciplined as you want. Is it? That's, I'm so glad we've said that because I think it's actually even more shameful because the people who generally struggle with this are intelligent, disciplined, hardworking, Overly burdened. You often, are kidding me. No, I'm serious. You're pulling you one over me. my head. I'm so glad we said this. We spoke. We You're pulling about one it. over my head. Because then the frustration <laughs> is: gosh. How am I not able to stop this behavior? If I can get up at 3 a.m. and do my workout, if I'm running a big company, if I'm an incredible mother, and I've got 50 gazillion things on my to-do list, I was. Running a, a guest house in Neisner, I was working almost 365 days a year, running a great business. I was doing all, you know, I was not lacking in discipline. The compulsion doesn't come from a lack of discipline. It comes from often restriction, hyper restriction with food or hyper. No kidding. Yeah. And then sometimes it's just from that desire to numb, escape, and that desire is bigger and oftentimes what I find, and a lot of people might resonate with this if they don't resonate with binge eating or bulimia, is the people who are the hardest working, they come home, they've still got a million things to do, they're absolutely exhausted, they're not getting the rest their body needs, and where's the one place they can just let go and go a bit crazy? Ah, it's when everyone's Correct. gone to bed. I just go, wah, the food. It's the one place I can be a bit naughty, a bit wild, have fun, let go. Do, do something just for me, especially because if they're not drinking. No, it's they don't even like have in that. the comfort zone, which leads into the euphoric state of the brain. Exactly. 
Because food does ah. that so well. Very. Food does it extremely well. Food also does it. Very much it's so. Letting go, the switch off, the willingness, the ability to stop all the to-dos. Well, let me take it a step further. Remember, mm -hmm. your body craves serotonin, which is and 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 um, uh, um, the happy gene. Happy gene, happy hormone. The dopamine? happy hormone. No, 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 not dopamine. Um, oh, oh, wait. <laughs> The name is on the tip of my tongue, man. Not endorphins. Wait. Not adrenaline. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know serotonin is the calm, comfort hormone. But serotonin, definitely one of them. To help Oxytocin? make the... Oxytocin? No. Oxytocin. <laughs> is that the one you're thinking of? That was that, the like, one love I was thinking of. Hormone. Oxytocin yeah. and serotonin to help you put in a relaxed mode. Now, if mm. I tread in uncharted territory, forgive me in advance, but bear with me. Also, when you are engaged in lovemaking, what happens mm -hmm. after you climax? Your body gets serotonin and it gets uh, oxytocin to help you relax after your body has had that influx of adren uh, adrenaline exactly. from having your erogenous zones extensively stimulated. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with food, especially when you take in excess amount of sugar. But then... The problem comes in with the excess, then your body doesn't get oxytocin and serotonin, it gets dopamine. And that's what drug addicts crave, that dopamine hit. Okay, so dopamine is the, they call it the molecule of motivation. So it's the Correct. desire that kicks in before you even eat the food. It's the knowledge that that good feeling's coming that drives Correct. the behavior. So it's such a powerful powerfully motivating because imagine you come home busy day 16 hours you're absolutely exhausted now you've got all the kids to take care of blah, 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 blah. but you know oh man if i could eat that big whatever it is i'm going to get that hit of oxytocin and serotonin and the dopamine's driving us towards the feeling very much so and it's that a dopamine urge let's call it that is very different to hunger so i think one of the things you're sort of saying was tell me about the mindset before we even get to the mindset what I'd usually do first is, can we distinguish between hunger, which is deep in the belly, mm. not always deep, but it's usually belly, versus the desire to eat. It's not hunger. This is probably dopamine spiking. That feels more like, <gasps> it's that rush. It's that desire, mm. the craving, mm. the motivation, right? And that's really hard to be in that place where all you want to do is just let rip. And anybody who's overcome addiction will know what I'm talking about. Very much. I just want to give in to that feeling. And I just yeah. want to go get that and to sit with that and ride it out to the other side. Now, so going back to your question, because we have to keep engaging with the behavior and the substance that create these feelings. And we've got to do it just a little bit, not too much, and stop when we're full. But meanwhile, that whole neurocircuitry is going, oh, but we could keep going and we'll get this other feeling. And... Also, to your point about the oxytocin and serotonin, when we eat a lot, what happens? Our bodies, it has to send all its energy to digestion, so we get tired. So people who don't who struggle to switch off can get that nice, ha. Oh. Yeah, you see, we're looking for, we're hunting for the feeling. And Correct. Because we have to play with food all the time. Well, not play with it. We eat food, you know, sometimes <laughs> three times a day, depending on what <laughs> everybody's protocols are especially when people are tired, because it takes this willingness to sit in all of this and not give in and only do it a little bit and try and stop when you're full, but not give in to that other urge. Mm. Especially when we're tired, it's extremely difficult. And we're only human. Very much. And inevitably, there's a moment where people just cave and they give in to the feeling. And I, this is that failure point that we call the slip. Yeah, yeah. Where I'm slip. like, awesome, let's learn. Because you know what's now, that, now I'm going to answer your mental question. Because in that place where they, were, they stop being hungry, they're full, but they want to keep eating, and they get that desire to keep going. In that place, there's usually a story that starts kicking in there. Yeah, yeah. We can I'm start intercepting you. that and changing it and buying ourselves just enough time for the dopamine levels to come down. Then you've got a good shot of getting to the other side. You do that repeatedly, it starts becoming a neural program. Eventually, Consistency. Do you hear stop. that? Consistency. <laughs> Consistency is key. Oh, consistency is key. And the willingness to keep going. And sometimes it takes these micro efforts. So 
I like to do everything with, again, it's the mindset. And you can imagine the kind of clients that come to me, so ambitious, so driven. And then I say to them, I tell you what, you're allowed to binge. I just want you to wait five minutes. And they're like, Mm. nah, they want to rock this. They want to perfect this. They want this thing done yesterday. (laughs) But unfortunately, (laughs) often it brings them to their knees. Then they're like, okay, let me just try five minutes. And then that five minutes, then we can grow to 10 to 15 and so on and so forth. And that was the lesson that I learned with working out because I thought if I work out in three months, then muscles are going to start appearing because that's what <laughs> men's health would say, for yes. example. Yeah. But that's a lie. Yeah. It takes consistency beyond the three-month trial period going into six months. So then I said to myself, okay, can I try this routine out? Don't think about the results. Can we commit to this balanced routine for three months? Mm. Okay. Three months done. Can we try and uptake it by another three months? Can we can maintain it? Another three, then another three after that. And before one knows it, a year goes by. Oh my okay. gosh. You're looking you're looking great. What have you been doing to yourself? But now we're gonna to touch on something which I feel that needs to be touched. Telling mm-hmm. the hard truth. Mm-hmm. Especially when it comes to what you are specializing in. Mm. Not easy at all. Thus, Mm -hmm. the hard truth. When people come to you and they ask you for advice with regards to their relationship with eating, fitness, and the like, Mm -hmm. do you feel that you are very empathetic when you tell them or advise them? Or have there been times where you have said, listen, now you've got to open your ears because what I'm about to lay on you is going to be a tough pill to swallow? Both. (laughs) And usually by the time we're having that conversation, so first when I meet somebody, we'll always just find out what's going on. I try and have a completely beginner's mind and make try and make as few assumptions as possible to see if where they're at is the same as what I think it is. And then if I can help them. If the answer is yes, I have to have a 10 out of 10 level certainty in my mind that I can help before I offer help. Because, Chris, somebody who's struggling does not want to have to fail again in terms of, oh, I tried this thing to stop and it didn't work again. Trust me, they probably tried a lot of things. Every Mm. diet's failed them. Every restrictive measures failed them. Therapy, not I don't want to say failed them, but maybe it wasn't the whole solution. Mm. And people often reach out to me as a last resort. You know, nobody's reaching out to an online coach in the middle of Spain (laughs) because, you know, they had better choices. It's usually they've tried a few things and I'm the last resort. And so... We both need to be feeling 10 out of 10. But by the time we get to the point where we start talking about what is the solution, what is my advice, a lot of those puzzle pieces have clicked because I try and guide people to help them through their own exploration get those, oh, of course, moments where they can Mm -hmm. go, oh, now I understand how the – and when we get it, when we hear truth, we know. You can Uh, feel it inside. It clicks. I love that answer. Yeah. I really love that answer. So they know they're already there. They don't have to have me tell them. Preaching to them. Sometimes there's a bit of they want to go fast and kind of like a personal trainer. If you come in and you say, I want to run a marathon tomorrow, I want to be, I want to lift, you know, twice my body weight tomorrow, your trainer will be like, whoa, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> start with just 50%. <laughs> or let's, let's start with body weight and then we'll worry. Because sometimes you just want to go slow well, down. Because I'm training her. This could take, oh, good. <laughs> This takes longer than you think. And I think that's the hard truth nobody wants to hear. We -hmm. want this instant gratification, quick fix. But with food, it doesn't work like that. There's no just stop today and never again. It's you need to be willing to fail. We're going to fail a lot. I'm going to push you through every time you want to quit because you're going to want to quit. You're going to think it's not working. And, um, And if you do that and you just show up consistently, even if you failed from Monday to Sunday, and you just keep being willing to learn and try again and try again and try again, you will get the wins and they will come. And we'll do this for as long as it takes. And for some people, that's eight weeks, ten weeks before they start getting real breakthroughs. For other people, it can take a year. And right. I don't care, Chris, if it takes them 12 years, provided we just keep working. It won't take 12. <laughs> provided they keep working and they're willing to just keep showing up. And you, the, this is, goes back to the mindset. How hard is it to keep showing up and be willing to try? where you keep falling back. It would be like constantly having a drink and constantly falling off the horse. It's that the the, the corrosion to the sense of confidence 
you know, people come in and they're like, right, I'm going to deal with this, which is awesome. They need that. And then the slip and then another slip and another slip. And they start yeah. thinking, what if I'm never going to make it? And I, the role I play as the coach is you are not giving up, not on my watch. We keep going. Look at all the improvements because people often forget how far they've come. You know, you'll be deadlifting your body weight. Like, I can't understand why I can't get to twice. You know, but a month ago, you couldn't pick up a, I don't know, five kilo dumbbell. You know, it's like, okay, hold on, wait. You already do these things better. You know, things like maybe they're going out for, re- they can have meals at restaurants. They used to be very anxiety pro- provoking. Maybe they're able to have just half a packet of chips and put the rest away. That's stuff that for a normal eater, that might just be easy. But for them, it was really hard. That's where they had compulsion. Right. But sure, okay, so maybe once in a month they've had a slip up and they ended up binging. Yeah. Hey, yeah. it happens. Learn, let's keep going. Don't give up. You keep moving. A little bit of nostalgia I want to share with you. There's two places that I really miss uh, in Cape Town. I yeah. hope when I mention the names, how long did you live in Cape Town before you eventually emigrated to, to, to Spain? Or I were lived you... in Cape Town before I had moved to Neisner and I lived in Cape Town for maybe three years. So not a huge amount of time, but long enough. To know okay. there. Do you remember uh, Saddles Steakhouse? That rings a bell. Where was it? It was a franchise. It was all over Cape oh, Town. From, yes, from, yes, yes, from yes, Brackenfell yes. to Table View, uh, then to Stelly's. And then there was also one in, in, in um, Paul, just oh, opposite God. Paul Boys Gymnasium. Copy. And they had the best steak. And I mm-hmm. uh, look, I'll I'll play open card. I'm a sucker for a good steak, and I'm a sucker for a good pizza. Mm-hmm. And no one could do it like Saddles because they always had grass-fed meat. It was not oh, wow. synth- synthesized meat like with what you remember that rainbow chicken scandal that happened in in St- Stelly's. Yes, they always ensured that their cattle had grass-fed, and they checked their consistently for any excess hormones. Because it's believed that the cancer that I had came directly from hormone-fed meat. Oh, wow. That makes so much sense, Chris. Wow. And um, and then there was another franchise that was in Durbanville from where, where I came from um, called Cattle Baron, who also specialized. That. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, they were if great. I think there I, was one in Joburg, which was amazing. There was one in, 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 in Boxburg, which saw a very, very short l- uh, lifespan. But then yeah. speaking of uh, Joburg, do you remember the Eastern Frontier? No. In Atlasville. <laughs> no. Which part from Joburg were you from? Um, uh, Waverley. Oh, Waverley, Waverley. So yeah. you're more Johannesburg South Side. I was more on the East Rand. I can never remember that. Wasn't that North? <laughs> I can't remember Because <laughs> I know. Uh, let's quickly like... think. Waverly, Waverly, uh, more Johannesburg. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You, uh, it's more Alberton side. Sorry, I forgot. Oh gosh, I don't know. I've forgotten all of it now. Can you believe it? Well, of course, you've been overseas. But either way, you, there was. You were telling me it was nostalgia on the steak. <laughs> and no one could do it like them. And it's very sorry that the fast food industry didn't adopt that as a whole, mm. um, because I think it that doesn't could make also, them as much money. Uh, <laughs> yeah and we don't want to go into that that's a whole other podcast <laughs> that is a whole other podcast completely yeah. but uh, I just also want to touch on something which you mentioned because it's also my love um, yeah. I hold a diploma in the discipline what kind of movies did you enjoy when you were a child or when you were younger shall I rather say oh, Goonies was the first thing that came to my mind <laughs> they've just Massive re-released a, a new anniversary blu-ray of the Goonies can you believe oh, no way. It? That's so perfect. Yeah. And I oh, still I haven't seen it. I still haven't seen it. There's a hole in my education. Really? What? <laughs> no, I, I haven't you seen it. You are 10 years younger than me, so fair enough. Well, I mean, I missed uh, The Goonies. I missed Back to the Future. Oh, yeah, that's my jam. But I loved Lethal Weapon, the making of that oh, one. Yeah. I loved James Bond. Which you still had got on VHS back in the day. Do you remember that, yeah. Grandma? And on Laserdisc. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank God that's all changed. <laughs> One of the things, actually, we've got to be watchful for with disordered eating recovery is that it doesn't jump to a new addiction. So ah, might, yes. 
for food, but suddenly they start like stealing from the whatever the store. You know, they have right. to make right. or something. So when that's happening, we know we haven't actually dealt with the underlying cause because the disorder is only the symptom. It's the underlying stuff that drove us to start reaching for booze or food or sex or whatever in the first place or drugs. That's where we got to do the work. And when I I feel if I can work with somebody long enough, it's 100% because we'll just keep learning, improving, growing to the point where eventually they start to relax and they feel that that freedom, they get to a point where I'm there and many of my clients where they just think, I can't really imagine what it would take to throw me now. As opposed to, man, if somebody told me I had a week left to live, I'd just go binge like crazy. Nobody's saying that. There's no right. part of them that wants it anymore. It would have to be something big that might create that old, might wake up a circuitry that's still there, if it's still there. But I think most of it's gone. By the time you've done this long enough, your brain's redirected its resources. And I have to really pay you a compliment. But if I pay you a compliment, it's because I'm, I'm stating fact from what I'm seeing. The person I see here in front of me, I think has gone through hell and back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think this person who is sitting here in front of me has got a gift to talk, absorb, evaluate, and formulate. Now, you are here with me on a podcast talking about the work that you do. If I may suggest, you can ha carve yourself a career in this business as well with your niche that you've discovered for yourself. I say, I say your niche, you're delivering a service um, based on the gray area that you've discovered in your journey. Mm -hmm. And I think really you've gotten a niche here, so please forgive me where I said your niche. You've discovered an, uh, a niche here, which is to investigate, and I think you can, you can really stretch your muscle by perhaps, let's say, writing a cookbook and telling a bit of your life story and your relationship with food. Do you think something of an idea would germinate with you like that? I'm already writing a book. <laughs> and uh, Bingo, yesterday, Yassi. one of my good friends, because um, of course being a journalism student, I have many friends in the journalism world, was encouraging me to start a podcast. So it feels like my next calling is to start bringing more conversations, shedding more light taking away the shame, just getting it out there. Great stuff. So, now, you've so really got a gift so on you, Helen. You've really got a, you've really got a gift. Um, and don't think of yourself as unqualified. Remember, <laughs> the distance between madness and genius is measured purely by success. And I think you are going to be successful in going forward. And I love the way you are thinking about this. You are very, very humble. Remember, just like with the with with a plant, it starts from a seed. It needs fertile ground. It needs liquid, and then it starts to germinate. And then that germination period itself mm. is a long, hard slog. But it's oh, every given analogy. step of the. But it's the, it's every given step of the way, the journey. It's not the end destination. And I think oh, you I are completely agree. And I think you are really getting a good head start in. And I think you should be very, very proud because I certainly am. Oh, I certainly am you, indeed. And I, I I never thought this conversation was going to be so satisfying. Oh, really. I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, because we only met just a minute before we started this. So that's it's been delightful. And she flitted with me on email, believe it or not. So easy. <laughs> <laughs> but Helen, if people hearing this have really been um, paying attention and they struck a breath with you, where can they get in touch with you? Well, my name's Helen Bennett, which there are a lot of me out there. <laughs> so I think the best thing to do, I mean, my website is helenbennett.co, easy peasy. If you can't, if you're struggling to find me, Coach Helen, Food Freedom, just Google it. You'll find me everywhere on the social medias. Instagram's probably where I'm in the most um, mm -hmm. active, and that's at Coach Helen Bennett. So that's a great place to start. But if you just say Helen, Food Freedom, I think you'll find me. <laughs> Great stuff. But thank you, Chris. It's been an absolute joy chatting to you. And, and thank you as well for coming on the show and telling your story and sharing your, your vision uh, with such positivity and such vigor and such verve. And you're the first South African on this on this podcast. And what? Yeah. I'm honored. 
I'm so I've tried excited. how many times to get the uh, the ZAs here, but then they just think oh. not a chance. They would rather go to Jacaranda or they would rather go to High Felt and then they get the the proverbial big finger or they would rather go to Gareth Cliff. And uh, <laughs> I'm sorry to say that prick spoke at my commencement ceremony and he's down for six, if I do say so myself. <laughs> You know, I have no judgment. I'll be on everybody's shows, Chris. But I tell you what, <laughs> when I first hear, heard um, Apex Predator, so much of it resonated with me. The, there's a lot of things that you say that I don't necessarily agree with or I have different opinions on. But what I love most about this show is the f ability to speak freely. Absolutely. And what I love is I know that you have a respect and a curiosity about all of it. And that's it's the university of life, my friend. It is. And to feel seen and valued, even when we don't necessarily agree, I think is one of the biggest gifts we can give each other as human beings. Absolutely. And agree to disagree. Hmm. That's been yeah. what's also missing in our society today. It's Look, I'm not, I'm, I'm, not the, I'm not the begin all, end all on any given authority. You just mentioned it yourself. You've hmm. got to a set amount of values in your heart I've got a set amount of the values of, our, of the heart we don't necessarily always have to mesh uh, to, 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 to be copacetic towards one another but come on man let's learn from one another mm. yeah. let's not silence one another I will never never ever ever give anyone any probable cause to shut them down and unfortunately someone like Gareth Cliff does if you say something that he doesn't agree with, he will shut you off. I will <laughs> never do that. Well, maybe that's your gift. Well, my friend, that was what our democracy is based on. Helen Bennett yeah, has been my guest here on APX. Again, that's helenbennett.co if you want to read up about Helen's work. Or key in in Google, Helen Food Freedom. And like Helen, you as well, madam, dear sir, well, ultimately, through your freedom that you obtain, through your food, food freedom, through your home that you make nice and holy and make a profitable dwelling, you will become an unstoppable mind, an unbreakable mind, I should rather say, an unstoppable force, an untamed spirit, your own army of one, and ultimately, an apex predator. Guys, look after yourself. Until the next time, I'm Chris Nell. That's Ellen Bennett. God bless.